Hey there. Welcome to the last episode of the Tactic Talk series, at least for now. While it has been a lot of fun joining up with some other Marvel Crisis Protocol content creators, unfortunately this series is going to come to an end for a couple of reasons. The first is because of an opportunity to have someone else do a lot of the editing for a similarly formatted discussion. If you want to find out more about this, check out House Party Protocol's newest episode this Thursday. And then the second reason is that with the extra four to seven hours I have freed up, I'm going to be able to begin covering a new upcoming miniatures game that I'm getting pretty excited about. But if you want more info on that, check out the new video that is coming out tomorrow. Uh, but for now, enjoy this great discussion between myself, Justin, and Todd from Turn Zero Gaming as we talk about the different affiliations and how they stack up against one another. My name is Nate, and welcome to the Gamers Guild. Hello there, and welcome to the show that should have been a podcast, Tuesday Tactic Talks. Today we have Todd from Turn Zero Gaming, a podcast that has recently begun to focus on Marvel Crisis Protocol and focuses uh, really well on strong combinations of characters and strategies. And then we have Justin from the Predator Squadron, which is really just the banner we fly as our uh, local playgroup. Justin has previously joined uh, Turn Zero on some of their more recent podcasts, including a super in-depth uh, tier listing of all the characters. Is, is that what you call it? Super in-depth? Dude, yeah. it, was, it was very in-depth. Uh, four hours <laughs> of me uh, listening <laughs> to stuff counts as super in-depth. Yeah, it was it was uh, intense. I feel like we could, probably could have cut it to three hours if we had uh, taken out a couple of the beverages. <laughs> I, I will agree, and I blame Mike. <laughs> I, I, I will agree with that assessment. <laughs> poor, poor defenseless Mike. Uh, cool, guys. Well, today we are going a little bit uh, further in on affiliations. Uh, have a few questions set up for that, but what I like to do to give everybody kind of idea of what people are running in different places and different metas, whatever you want to call it, is uh, go over the rosters that if you were to go to a three-round event tomorrow, what characters and cards are making your roster. So for me right now, uh, I'm going to be bringing Captain America, Hulk, Vision, Black Widow, along with Thor, Hela, Valkyrie, Black Panther, Shuri, and Killmonger. So I'm kind of divided amongst those three. Uh, for my team tactic cards, I've got Avengers Assemble, Usurp the Throne, Odin's Blessing, Brace for Impact, Trip Up, Patch Up, and Follow Me, as well as Advanced R&D. And then for the Crisis cards, I've got Gamma Waves, Riot Spark Over Extremis, uh, and the Deadly Meteors. For the secure ones and all my extraction ones, I have the Struggle for the Cube Continues, the Mystic Wakandan Herbs, and Fear Grips the World as the Worthy Terrorized Cities. Uh, overall, I, I can run Wakanda, but it's not really a focus for me. I'm really enjoying the Avengers, and the durability of the uh, Asgardian affiliation is really strong, and I've been enjoying that with uh, the three characters I have in that. Uh, Todd, what are you uh, currently playing around with? So I actually just went to an event this past weekend. Uh, it was a 22-player event we had up in Northern Virginia. Uh, and so I also just wrote an article about this exact topic um, where I broke down how I build my list. Um, for me, I start from the objectives and then build my team out from there. Um, but for this event that I went to, my list, my 10-character list that I took uh, were Shuri, Thor, Vision, Captain America, Black Panther, Killmonger, Valkyrie, Winter Soldier, Hulk, and Okoye. Uh, the, the eight tactic cards that I took, do, do, do. Uh, so I took Advance R&D, uh, Brace for Impact, Drop Off, Patch Up, uh, Usurp the Throne, Gamma Launch, Field Dressing, and Avengers Assemble. Um, the primary idea behind this going into the event was I felt if I lost the priority role, most players were going to actually pick um, the extraction objective. Uh, I felt pretty strongly that most people were going to be picking that because 
some of the heavier point objectives lie in red, in particular the uh, the herb objective at 15 points. And I had built my lists off of the blue uh, objectives, so off of the secure objectives. Um, so my secure objectives that I took were gamma waves, uh, deadly meteors, and riot sparks over extremists 3.0. The t what I did was I was planning on picking either gamma waves or the riot spark. Uh, the me the deadly meteors was only there as a bait and like a lesser of evils and kind of for people to feel comfortable picking red anyway, uh, which worked out to my favor. I always got to play on one of the objectives I wanted, which was either gamma or riots, because the way I had built that list was to narrow the field and play on a line or, or, or to play either on the center line vertically or horizontally. Uh, Cause I wanted to stack my team with some heavy hitters like Hulk and Thor and Cap and then splash in whoever I needed to finish out the lineup. Um, and it worked, uh, that plan worked really well for me. Awesome, man. And I, I, I have the exact same uh, secure objectives with kind of the exact same mentality of like, hey, Let's, uh, let's force combat. Let's not let anybody uh, hide in the background. Yep. Absolutely. Justin, any thoughts? Well, um, I know Todd is an excellent player, and his uh, building from the objective cards out is very much the opposite of how I do things. I tend to build from the characters and try and take objectives that I like for my build. Um, so it's interesting to hear that tactic uh being used but i also know that um todd has studied these characters thoroughly and if i was one thing i know about todd uh re-rolls are king for him so any card or any character that gives him a re-roll especially free re-rolls he will value greatly in fact i think your one complaint is you didn't take baron zemo in this list is that right yeah so in the article i go over that like valkyrie was my flex spot and I had Valkyrie or Zemo there, yeah. and I ended up mm -hmm. I ended up going with Valkyrie because I thought I was going to value the throw more than the reroll, at least for this weekend, um, and, and that that came back to bite me. My one game where I took the Valkyrie uh, was the one game that I lost. Oh no! So uh, and very similar here. I, I had Zemo in my list, but. Uh, ended up swapping out with Valkyrie because they they are extremely similar, but they both those uh, melee focused characters with charge, very uh, DPS heavy. Uh, but uh, I I subbed her in because she is as guardian, and I I do like the durability that uh, that squad brings out. Yeah, it, it's a solid like it's a solid point, and she did do well. Like, don't get me wrong, uh, she did well in that in that match. Um, but what I noticed more than her ability to deal a couple extra points of damage was how many points of damage I was missing on other rolls. Um, and, and that one or two came back to bite me because that game ended up being a lot tighter than I initially thought it was going to be. The, the final score in that game was 14 to 16. And I, and I actually had enough victory points in my control at the end that I could have actually closed out that game and won it. Uh, and then he got some good re-rolls, and I had some bad defense rolls. Um, so, like, at any point, any one or two of those die rolls swing, that game goes differently. Yeah. Uh, Justin, what would you bring to uh, this theoretical event tomorrow? Theoretical event tomorrow, and this is presuming I don't have the new cards. Um, I would run with a much more Cabal-centric list. I would do Baron Zemo, Black Panther... Killmonger, Modok, Okoye, Red Skull, Shuri, Ultron, Venom, and Vision as my characters. Um, the eight tactics cards I would bring, I would do Brace for Impact, Cosmic Invigoration, Drop Off, Mission Objective, Patch Up, The Age of Ultron, Usurp the Throne, and Wakanda Forever. Um, the Objective cards, the secure uh, cards, I would do all of the 17-pointers, Deadly Meteors, Infinity Formula Goes Missing, and Riot Spark over Extremist 3.0. 
And then I would go with a similar uh, setup for the extraction cards. The Scrolls Infiltrate World Leadership, Spider Infected Invade Manhattan, and Struggle for the Cube Continues. And my reasoning behind this is mostly just to kind of throw people for a loop. So many content creators, so many people that I know have been designing these like really tight 15 point lists. And that's what they are focused on. And sometimes they'll build out from there. But normally it's like, they're like, well, for 17, I'll just, I don't know, add in Black Widow, whatever. Mm -hmm. So if I can build and design and work on a more cohesive 17 point list that I feel comfortable with and make them play on those 17 point objectives, it, it helps me um, kind of counteract some of these new crazy Thor hulk missile launches that i've seen <laughs> now i will say that um, my list uh, the only reason why i don't have loki in it is because i don't have him painted yet but uh, loki would be in there probably in the place of ultron um if i were to build this again with a fully painted list that's fair understand that make sure uh, your pretty uh, picture is uh, up and all that kind of stuff yeah i, I wanted to make it nice for the the, the picture there yeah, I'll get him painted. He's, he's sitting over there. He's primed. He's ready. He's just not not ready to go yet. I understand it. Todd, you have any uh, comments on Justin's list? Uh, no, it, it's interesting because it, it's actually a point of contention within the group uh, that, that we've actually had this conversation back and forth as to do you come into a, a an event with a – streamlined game plan to try and stay on one or two objectives or do you build wide and play to the strengths of being able to play on any format and and, it, and it's one of those arguments that i i think we'll have until we have a major event right like because we're, we're always going to go back and forth on which strategy is the best and and in any given weekend for that matter like that can all come up aces for one person or you know x's for the other guy um, and, and that's kind of the fun of this game um, is, is trying to find that level and where, where you need to be at. Um, I, I think for, for my style, I, I like the idea of having options in my list that I can go a couple different ways. That's why I build from the objectives first because I know, I know I at least have the ability to guarantee I'm going to be on one of four objectives uh, or one of two objectives from either color, right? So... Mm -hmm. That that's where I try and build my list. So I actually narrow down my objectives to four, two red and two blue, and try and plot for those, and then play that into my opponent based on what they pick. Yep, it's uh, it's so interesting because we you don't know what two cards that they draw, and you want to make sure that you don't get stuck with uh, certain scenarios that can lead to uh, an, an utter demise. I've uh, a few times gotten this. Uh, I don't run it anymore, but uh, this ball of uh, Red Skull, Hulk, and MODOK for Gamba Waves, because there used to be quite a few more uh, ex extraction cards that had multiple uh, or just single find and get that objective. So I just kind of brought this kill team in to wipe the opponent's squad out, and the, the scoring didn't really matter there at the end. But yeah. it's, a, it's a great discussion, and... Uh, I even differ from both of you guys. Uh, I look at what affiliation I want to make sure that I have access to and kind of go from there. So it's like, cool, I, I like the Avengers. I like that play style. So I know I'm going to bring Captain America. Thor's a great heavy hitter now. Black Panther's a great objective getter. Cool, what other Avengers do I want to bring and kind of uh, build the list that way. So it's, it's always so cool to see how diverse people are able to come in looking at this. Yeah, I, I will add, I, I did make some changes to that initial lineup um, that, that I went over. Um, I, I did switch Valkyrie out and brought Zemo back in. And I also dropped Vision and brought back in Captain Marvel. Um, just because of how prevalent throws are now in the game. Uh, mm -hmm. with, with Thor's ability to throw three times in a turn if he gets lucky... Vision feels really squishy, um, uh, especially if they come into Vision and they hit him with a physical attack first, and then you're forced to switch into his physical protection mode. Um, and then they're just like, cool, I'm going to tee off on you and just throw some stuff. 
Um, th you can lose a character quicker than you think. Um, so, yeah. 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 Like it, it can get aggressive. Um, and the, the other change that I made just based on my lineup choices was in my tactic cards. Um, field dressing was super impressive to me on paper. Um, and I had, I felt like I had to include it because I was running small three and four character lineups that were very aggressive, but I ended up after playing in the tournament, feeling like a uh, recalibration matrix would be better in that spot. Mm. So that was one of the, the, those were the changes that I made to that list after the tournament. Yeah. I almost feel like uh, field traffic, uh, field dressing would be better in a high activation list. Agreed. Uh, to, to make it annoying. So like, oh, you thought you dealt with this guy. Let me go get Rocket Raccoon back up and uh, let him continue doing annoying things. I, I totally agree. Like that. that's actually where I see that card fitting in. The more that I've gotten, the more reps I get in, the more it feels like it's for a wide team and not so much a narrow team. Yeah. Cool. Well, well, I'm going to try to keep this uh, not super, super long, so I'm going to go ahead and get into the questions that I have for you guys. Uh, and the first question, since we are talking about affiliations, and I have seen people uh, debate on this a little bit, not too much, but is taking an affiliation needed to be able to play well in Marvel Crisis Protocol? Uh, and Todd, I'll let you uh, go ahead and start us off on this one. So, so if, if anyone's listened to the podcast, or if you haven't, we have a we have a gentleman on the team uh, by the name of Chris, um, and, and he is very high on a Wakandan herb list uh, that runs no team affiliation, um, and, and it's a very good roster. It's it's very tough to beat. Um, and so I I see the value in certain lists where you don't have to have an affiliation. That said. Personally, I always plan to take an affiliation because there's just too much benefit, especially when you're looking at the Avengers or Cabal in particular, where you have the ability to either gain extra power slash resources or discount powers through cap. Uh, I, I think the value there is too high to, to, to play without um, for me personally. So I, I know there's value in not having a affiliation, but I also know that there's a higher upside with having the affiliation. Yep, I, I understand where you're coming from, Justin. What are uh, what are your thoughts? So I tend to look at the perks and the downsides of uh, each affiliation. Where my roster, I run Cabal and Wakanda. Wakanda for me works really well on the kind of low to the ground, the 15 point and to kind of a lesser extent, the 17 point uh, missions, 18, 20, and when the 19 point comes out, like I would rather have one of the harder hitting or tankier groups, either Avengers, Cabal, Asgard, something like that in those higher point totals. But for the 15 point, I want three really great characters shuri black panther killmonger on our tier list those are all at least tier one if not tier zero they are like three of the probably top 10 characters in the game so having a core unit of that combined with really great cards like usurp the throne and wakanda forever if someone tries to do a tactic where they throw go all in on say shuri on your back line if you can survive that initial onslaught, you can retaliate and drop that character the next action, which is really powerful. Now, the problem is you have to survive that. <laughs> yeah. But um, because it's so easy to hit those affiliations, especially with dual affiliation characters like Thor, like Black Panther, you know, um, uh, Loki, you know, all of these characters that have multiple affiliations that you can tag on, and the addition of Winter Soldier, which is just anybody, I find it easy to hit whatever affiliation I'm going for and not have to worry about a non-affiliation because I want one other character a little more. Like, I'm willing to sacrifice a little bit of maybe effectiveness with a certain, like, role either like ranged energy damage or tankiness or whatever to get an affiliation bonus because those affiliation bonuses are so valuable 
like the amount of resource generation or resource like saving you get from Avengers or Cabal is crazy like potent compared to just a list of just heavy hitters. Yeah. Uh, so I, I agree with both of you. I think that uh, the affiliation bonus is good enough and important enough and easy enough to get that there's no reason to not try to get it. It's uh, the, the bonuses within the leadership abilities, whether that's the Cabal and getting more power for dealing damage, the reduction from Captain America, rerolls from Black Panther, being able to avoid status effects with uh, the Asgardians is huge on those higher threat characters. Uh, I, there's very little reason to not. Now, I have seen non-affiliated ones become successful. I've, I've even lost to one. Uh, in one of my earlier games. So, like, they're still good. You're able to just kind of pick and choose, man, I want to go with, like, all these characters that have charge. Let's line up Valkyrie. Let's line up Killmonger. Let's get Zemo in there and just go in and start wrecking stuff. Turns out that's good. But uh, I think the uh, the price of admission, especially now that we have Rogue Agent and Bucky, uh, the, the team tactic cards that it unlocks is the other reason I am very much uh, set on always trying to have an affiliation because those uh, those are typically the best team tactic cards we have access to in the game. That yeah. and that's definitely a, a solid statement too. Because it, you do get access to some really good team tactics cards uh, once you take those affiliations. Um, Wakanda Forever is the one that sticks out in my head. Um, that that card, just having that in your eight to scare somebody with is like aggressive and, and it, it's kind of like a i don't know like i want to use choice words here but i i'm not gonna but it, it, i appreciate it, it. it use, definitely... use use your your coded words like fiddlesticks and horse feathers <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it definitely but it will definitely make your opponent or your opponent question what they want to do based on the idea that Man, that guy might pull out Wakandans, and he's got Wakanda forever. Uh, if they're running an aggressive Thor list or something like that, they'll be like, I may not want to just throw him out in the middle of that. Um, and, and that's just from it being in your eight, not necessarily even being in your hand yet. Um, so that's that's another thing to really think about because that there is definitely there is the ability to bluff in this game. Um, mm -hmm. and, and you can bluff with objectives and tactics cards just off the initial setup and being like, here's my 10, here's my 8, here's my cards. This, these are the ways I can go. What, what do you think I'm going to do? Yeah, Absolutely. and on a, on a related note, that is why I bring the Age of Ultron with my 8 cards. Because the idea of dealing with an Ultron that you've taken out completely, and then all of a sudden he comes right back up full health, ready to rock is terrifying to people and it totally modifies how they approach your list how they play your 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 objectives how they target you and it, they could never hit ultron and i am totally okay with that that is worth a card to me for him to just have free reign to go wreak havoc so so can i can i propose a question to you two guys we we actually just went over affiliations on our last podcast with turn zero how do you guys actually rank the affiliations. Which one do you think is the strongest to weakest? Avengers is the strongest. I'd agree. Um, I would say Cabal and Wakanda are similar-ish. And I like Avenger, the Asgardians, but they are probably the weakest out of the four currently. Now, I'm not going to rank Guardians in there yet because I haven't played with them yet. But I get the feeling they're probably going to edge up into that mid-tier for me. Uh, what about for me, you? I think for, for me right now, there's two tiers. Uh, I think there is the Avengers and Cabal tier. They have a much wider roster to pick from and have very strong and very versatile tactic cards. Uh, Avengers Assemble, uh, a short move is huge, especially when it's a out of activation short move. So, hey, you push my Captain America away, he's back where he needs to be or something like that. And Cosmic Invigoration is might be the best tactic card in the game if you have access to it. I, I don't see why you're not running it. 
Uh, the reason that I think the Asgardians and the Wakandans are on that on a very similar level is the Wakandans have absolutely zero mystic attack. And with Captain America still running out pretty heavily, Black Panther uh, is a character that needs answering, uh, being able to have easy access to a mystical attack that Hela provides, that Loki kind of provides, I think uh, keeps the Asgardians uh, a little bit higher ranked in my mind than uh, some others. But I'm also very interested to see how the rest of the Guardians pan out, because they have a, a deeper roster than even the Avengers, who currently have the deepest. Yeah, I, like, and that's kind of how I, I've gone with my my ranking as well. Like, I, I feel like Avengers is definitely top tier. Um, I feel like Cabal is second. Um, and then I put, uh, I actually have Guardians above Wakanda. Um, and, and then Wakanda and, and Asgard. That that's kind of how I broke mine down as well. I do I do think that that guardian's ability people like sometimes overvalue how good cards can be. But if you how so how you get tokens that you can use to reroll? Is it two tokens? Three, three tokens. Three tokens that reroll two each. Yeah. So uh, that as a card would be amazing. Yeah. So taking like a card out of your five that maybe is situationally kind of usable, but sometimes you don't really need it. That's okay. Like I've got my, my brace for impact and my patch up and then I've got, you know, the Milano crew or whatever their card is. And then that leaves me two cards that I can sort of go whatever direction I want. I might take that one where rocket gets to shoot a bunch and then a fifth card that, you know, drop off or something that sometimes it might be good it depends on the setup but sometimes i just want those re-rolls man and you just discard that card and get them for free most of the time you would have to pay a minimum of three resources for like each character that got a token yeah like, i i think that 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 ability is once people start using it and actually seeing it in action that's gonna they're gonna be a strong strong team yeah i, I will say that i think you you spoke of ultron and I think he's probably one of the strongest characters with uh, Guardians yep. because of his card. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. You either target him. Don't into that too much. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. I didn't mean to hide that, man. <laughs> uh, I, I will say I think it's a really strong leadership ability. I, I don't necessarily want to say people are overvaluing it right now because we, we don't know its actual full extent but it is only once per round, and it's it, you have to use those tokens on different rerolls. Uh, so if you have a setup where you can, uh, I, I've got a couple characters that I, I really like it for Rocket being one of them. But if they're not doing, uh, if they're not being attacked and getting to use uh, it, the third token for the defense roll, maybe they get two attacks and are able to use it like that. Uh, but the fact that it's only once per round, I think it's a little bit more limiting uh, so that you can't just have a crazy pop-off turn with it. Like I said, I want to try it before I rule on it. So that's why I didn't even rank it. But currently, I mean, like, Cabal and Avengers are probably still more powerful than it, but I could see it being, like, my third favorite and it, it's so cheap to get their squad. Like you can get a, a guardian squad for what eight points yep. right now. Eight, eight like, affiliation is or, or eight to uh, threat for three characters, which is yeah. usually where that uh, you're usually going for a five man squad. And honestly, like if you look at the upcoming uh, roster and knowing or I guess their affiliation card, uh, at least two more of those characters are very likely going to be three pointers. Yeah. Uh, so it's a, they've they've got some versatility coming down the road as well. Like but before being, we uh, go, go ahead. ahead, I was just going to oh. say being able to have a four man affiliated roster with like eleven points is crazy. Like, what is it? Asgard has no option for that. Oh, actually, with Winter Soldier, they could have an eleven point for three man, but but then you're not running Thor. 
Right. Well, no, you can. You have to run Thor because he's the leader. But Thor, Valkyrie, and Winter Soldier gives you Asgard for a three. Lane. But that's three characters instead of four. Three characters instead of four. No, no faction can do four characters like that. Guardians can, except for Guardians. Yeah. All right, anyway, uh, so for this episode, I've done something a little bit different, and each of us have been assigned uh, – well, I, I assigned homework for my guests, and I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> but I've given out at least one affiliation to cover for these next couple of questions. That way we didn't all have to be masters on all the different subjects. Uh, so I'm going to be covering the A&A of Avengers and Asgardians. Uh, Justin, you're going to be covering the Cabal for us. And Todd has the Wakandans and the limited info that we do have for the Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, so the second question I have is, what does your affiliation do well? What is its weak points? And what crises do you think your affiliation looks the best at? Uh, Justin, would you like to uh, kick us off for this one? Sure, I've got the easy one, so I only have one affiliation. Um, Cabal is the aggro team. Um, they want to attack early and often. The characters tend to be more aggro y when you look at like Killmonger, Baron Zemo, even Modok um, can throw some hurt out early. Um, their ability is all based on like attacking and hitting, and there's no passiveness to it. So you don't like sit back and defend like Avengers do. You want to go out there and get in the middle of it. So looking at the just strength of it, that's where you want to be. Like, I know Loki is a Cabal member, and his playstyle doesn't really fit into it. Now, he offers a lot of utility that I think is very useful for any affiliation, any faction. But I want Red Skull with, you know, a lot of melee heavy hitters that are ready to go in and just destroy people. Like, you know, I want second activation to be a dazed one for most of my opponent's characters. Yeah, uh, I like that. Uh, any uh, particular weak points that you would uh, poke holes uh, in the Cabal for? Well, their ranged capability is very limited. So you've got Modok, who is great, and he's got a Mystic Attack at range 4, which is awesome. And then he's got his Doomsday Chair, which is also great. But he's 5 cost. He is such a focus. Like it's you, You're going to be getting hit by everything with Modok. So Shuri's going to be pushing him every round, probably twice. You've got uh, Venom, who could be pulling him and attacking him. You've got uh, very, like, the, the own enemy's Killmonger is definitely going to be usurping the throne, because he's got a nice floating golden throne to take over. <laughs> um, so the, the whole ranged uh, attack option for that faction is a little limited. Now, that doesn't mean you can't bring in help. Like, we'll go over this later with another question, but there are some characters that do really well being added in because they offer that range capability that uh, the base characters are kind of lacking. Yeah, man, I think you uh, you nailed it pretty much on the head. Really, I think the, the Cabal is a, a really well-rounded affiliation, and there, there aren't that many holes to poke in it, which might be why... It, it's uh, up there on the uh, the tier list that we just uh, kind of went over. Todd, any uh, thoughts or anything to, to poke holes in the Cabal? No, I, I think Justin hit that pretty good, man. Like, the Cabal is designed to be aggressive. Um, now, with some of their later releases, um, Loki also offers them a good range attack uh, capability as well. Not as good as other affiliations, but he has a beam attack that also has a status effect, um, which is important to realize. I, I think Cabal is, as much as it can be aggro, it, it can also be probably one of the best control lists in the game. Uh, when you, Hands down. When, when you factor in, like, MODOK's ability to control characters and move them, and Loki's ability to slow them and increase their costs of their abilities in range four. Like there, there's a lot of things that are really good that Cabal can do as control and as aggro. Yeah. 
Uh, the the only hole I really have to pick at the Cabal, and it's not even a big one because most of them have ways to mitigate it, is pretty much all Cabal-affiliated members are pretty power-hungry. Uh, Modok has a lot of things that he can do in a turn. He usually wants a lot of power. Granted, he's usually able to get a lot of that back with Sonic Blast. Red Skull has access to just take an action to get some power at the cost of a little bit of damage. Crossbones Haymaker cost a ridiculous four. Uh, can continue down that path, but then Red Skull's Masters of Evil helps mitigate that as well. So uh, I think they're a, a pretty good all in all. Uh, so Todd, Todd, when was the last time you used Crossbones in a game? <laughs> <laughs> when, the, when, when did the core set come out? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like like I, I remember using him then. Uh, I, like no, I, I take that back. Like I've tried him a couple times because I, I want him to work. Like I don't, I don't want to ever put some character so far to the side that I'll never pull them out and at least look at them. Right? Like, and, and to AMG's credit, most of these characters are that way. And and yeah. I can give I can give argument to why Crossbones is not absolutely horrible. No, um, he's not. But, and honestly, you, when you talk about a control character, he's very aggressive, but he's also, I mean, yeah. he can hold a point really well. I totally agree. The problem comes in when you have a small base with a short movement, mm-hmm. even even with the extra movement, if you attack him, um, it, he just can't get there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that, that seemed like if he was on a medium base with like a cool rock or something, like... <laughs> <laughs> like if he, if he pulled an Ultron, is that what you're saying? Yeah, like if he pulled an Ultron, like I'd be all over that guy. But like the fact that he's on a small base with a short movement just means ignore him. Yeah, you'll, you'll yeah. have to deal with him turn three when he finally shows up. Yeah, and, and, and yeah. by that and by that time, if I'm going like objective heavy, I'll just control points and be ahead of you and say, all right, you can have that one. Yeah, and the the other side is. Like, well, he, he does have a great physical defense, two energy, uh, but we're getting completely off track. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you're good. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the Avengers real quick, and then I'll uh, talk about the Asgardians. Uh, for the Avengers, I think they are a very defensive affiliation. Uh, the bodyguard from Captain America kind of sets the tone for that. And they're also a very reactive uh, affiliation, in my opinion, because a day unlike any other works once per turn uh, and not once per round. So anytime you're able to get off for reactive abilities or abilities that usually cost two for one on the active side, uh, there's a lot of flexibility there. They're also very mobile. They have quite a few long-moving characters, and Avengers Assemble for that extra bit of mobility makes them really nice. Uh, they're they're not quite as uh, aggressive as the Cabal, who uh, really love just uh, putting uh, the herd out. But I think because of that, they're also pretty good objective holders. You've got characters like Black Widow, who has stealth, who wants to hide in the back. And then you also have characters like Vision and Captain Marvel that have pretty solid range four attacks to be able to uh, hold the uh, back line while laying down some cover fire. Uh, the, the weak point for them is they currently don't have any way to do mystic damage uh, within the affiliation, which hurts them a little bit right now, because in an Avengers mirror match, uh, it's just going to be a bunch of, uh, hey, I punch you and I block it, and back and forth with that, which uh, can make for a little bit more of a grindy game. Uh, let's see. Uh, as far as the crises, I think they really enjoy. I, I think any of the extraction objectives that have multiple uh, things to control, so not the mystical con and herbs, but things more like the struggle for the cube continues, uh, freer grips the world, and the spider infected are ones they really like. And I think they kind of go the way opposite. Uh, they don't really like gamma waves. They want to be able to be spread out and have little pockets of characters instead of one big brawl. Uh, but they do also do really well with the rights, uh, or not rights, the deadly meteors, because a lot of these guys have high energy defense naturally. Captain America, Thor, and uh, Captain Marvel all have four naturally, which is a really solid uh, amount to try to hold down those objectives without your opponent getting it. Uh <clears throat> So, Go so I'm gonna I'm only gonna disagree with you on one point. I, I think the Avengers have the most aggressive lineup at 15 points. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> At 15 points, they do, yes. And that, uh, if you were purely picking out the heavy guns, uh, I will give you that point all day. Yeah, I won three games with that one this past yep. weekend. Like, that that lineup is super aggressive. And, and for those who might not be familiar, I'm talking about Gamma Waves, and I'm talking about Thor, Hulk, and Cap. Um, that That is a super aggressive lineup that wants to get in your opponent's backfield as soon as it possibly can. And by that, I mean action one, turn one. Let's, let's go. Let's Gamma launch Thor into your opponent's backfield. Um, and, and then you, you throw their game plan off. Like now all of a sudden they have to account for the fact that you're sitting at a three-point objective and you probably charged somebody and probably threw a guy and then you threw another guy. <laughs> it's so gross. It's pretty gross. Thor, Thor just goes off and does his thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, but... And that is that is very confined, right? Like we're also talking about that on one objective, um, which also goes back to back your point at the same time. And unless you have designed something to play into that particular strength of this lineup, they are better at spread out objective control. Yeah, being able to uh, stay in pockets, Captain America, Captain America providing bodyguards, stuff like that, for sure. Uh, Justin, any thoughts on Avengers before I move on? I love them. They're probably my favorite affiliation to run. I like the characters in them, too. Like Thor, Cap, Vision. They all have really cool-looking models. They look great on the table. So just the aesthetic part of their affiliation is is top-notch. But um, they are more of a on the surface level, a defensive faction. Now, with the addition of Thor, that has changed things a little bit because they, they got a lot of punch added to their list. Because it used to be, like, what, Captain Marvel was the punch? And yeah, she's, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Well, it's, it's been Hulk, but it's it's one of those things that once you learn how to play around Hulk, right. Hulk becomes... Like, granted, if Hulk doesn't get damaged, he's still out there doing some pretty disgusting things. But, uh, yeah, if uh, they're... There's kind of a weird point with uh, Hulk. Yeah, yeah. Hulk, Hulk actually ended up being more of a finesse character than any of the characters I think they've come out with. Like, <laughs> like you have to know how to play Hulk in order to make Hulk anywhere near effective, which seems very odd. I feel like you should be able to put him on the table and say, this guy's going to break something. Hulk goes smash. Yeah, like, but he doesn't. Hulk doesn't always smash. No, he doesn't <laughs> at all. Cool. Uh, well, I'm going to go ahead and move on to Asgardians. Uh, it's an affiliation that, uh, in a word, is durable. Uh, Hela being able to come back from the dead, I think I've had her, quote-unquote, uh, be KO'd three times in a game and didn't was still on the table at the end of the game. She's uh, If you're able to time her activation well, she does wonderful things. Uh, the tactic card that is Asgardian with Odin's Blessing... Uh, being able to shift one of those just massive rolls kind of gives you access to almost a second recalibration matrix uh, in some ways where it's just like, man, that's a roll that I don't need to have happen. I'm just going to take one damage and call it a day is really strong. Uh, the downsides to them is they are a very elite faction. So you're going to have a low model count because a lot of these guys are a little bit more expensive. But on the plus side, they all hit really hard uh, or have a very diverse... Uh, Ability set, they're all getting multiple power a turn, which lets you do some uh, fun shenanigans between tactic cards and objective grabbing and stuff like that. Uh, but I, I really like them. Uh, any other thoughts uh, on Asgardians from you guys? Go ahead, Justin. Having played against your Asgardians a few times, they are super frustrating. Because you'll get someone down to, like, one health left, and then the next round, they heal up one, spending a power. Then, like, Loki will come over and, like, patch up for four more. And the next thing you know, it's a full health Hela again that you're having to deal with, which is already a nightmare. And the utility of dealing out those conditions like especially stagger stagger is backbreaking being able to just shrug that off the start of an activation is awesome 
And the fact that every one of them starts with two power is nuts. Like, power is such a commodity in this game. We talk about with, like, Cabal and Avengers having this, like, action economy, power economy. As Guardians just have it built in. He's like, yeah, whatever. You know, if you take Loki with the, the mind gem, he's got three power at the start of every round to do stuff with. That's that's potent. Yeah, it, it absolutely is. Uh, Todd, what are your thoughts? So, I, I'm I'm going to go against both you guys, and I, I don't like the Asgardian affiliation. <laughs> um, mainly because while while I agree they have the extra power generation built in, they are so extremely power hungry um, that even using their abilities sometimes feels like a hindrance. Uh, Loki, in particular, the ability to move out of combat and have you retarget someone else. Sounds great, but it also limits his power generation. Um, so, so if I can pressure you into situations where you have to make hard decisions about how to spend your power, um, I'm going to do it every time, all the time, all game. Um, and, and that's one of the main reasons I personally haven't run them as a faction, uh, other than the first game when I opened them. I was like, I'm going to try this out and just see what it does. Um for me, from a, from a competitive standpoint, this is not a faction that I feel like I want to run. Um, but that's my opinion, right? Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, I will say you should give them another try. Like, they, they are legit. They've got, they've got some punch. And all of their characters are pretty gross when you get them on the field. I, they, they, absolutely are, yeah. they, they absolutely are individually. Like, every one of those characters... When you look at their cards, you're like, man, this character is really good. This character is really good. And then when I look at them together in a team affiliation, I'm like, man, these guys are really good. They need a lot of power. Um, and and, and they, they need to be able to generate power on their own from the beginning of the game. Uh, and, and I feel like that's part of the, the trick with how to break down their lineup is if you can avoid them turn one or so, um, and, and they just get their two power, they're not as oppressive a, as they can be, right? They, they want to get into the mix, um, at, at least from my experience. Um, now, that said, like I would love to ask one question of you, Nate, to extend your podcast slash YouTube show a little bit further. What do you do with Hela and her tokens? Are you holding her tokens primarily for the reactivation and the save on the on on her flip side or are you using those pretty like freely for extra dice cool so it's a it's a really interesting combination of both uh so you, you point out power hungry and i agree that valkyrie is pretty power hungry and loki is pretty power hungry they they both have a lot of superpowers that they can go in and use uh but when you look at hella She's really right. not that power hungry. Uh, it, and so for me, uh, a Hela activation is pretty straightforward. The only attack I'm ever going to use with her is probably Claim Soul. Sure. Uh, because once you, like, if you're running as Guardians, you're, you're not, you're dazing guys left and right anyway. So when she gets up to three soul tokens, the first thing you do is you're going to use a Claim Soul attack and you're going to spend two of the soul tokens. So you can only use the soul tokens once per turn anyway. So that's going to give you two extra dice, a guaranteed bleed condition, and worst case scenario, Mystic Attack, six dice, up to then eight dice, you're going to deal at least one point of damage. Uh, sure. If, if not, I, I... You did it wrong. your dice and, yeah, like something, <laughs> something went horribly, horribly wrong for you. Uh, and then you're, you're probably going to have enough power for another claim soul attack. So at the very least... You've gotten the one soul back from that, and you're back at two souls. And if that attack dazed them, you're then back up to three souls, and you're back to where you started. She's going to be fine. Worst case scenario, you need to do a claim soul attack again, and then you're back up to three anyway, because more than likely, on a six dice mystic attack, one point of damage is going to squeeze in, because there aren't a lot of specifically against mystic defenses in the game, except for Ultron, which... It's a character that is not seeing the table nearly as often now that we have these extra 13 models. Uh, so that, that's how I'm using uh, Hella with her soul tokens. 
that and, and thank you. Like I, I think that's a conversation that needs to be had because I, I don't think enough people have explored really how to use Hella and and what's an effective attack slash like counterplay strategy with her. Yeah, she uh, she is very reliant on those soul tokens because if your opponent is able to get her to flip, uh, then once she is dazed. Uh, Goddess of Death is no longer effective, so if right. there's only two cell tokens on the field, if they're able to activate first before she gets a chance to go, they can wipe that four uh, health off the board very quickly. So it's extremely important for her to uh, keep those four, uh, the three soul tokens at all times and kind of making sure you have a game plan with claim soul, dealing damage, and possibly getting that daze or knockout, uh, and having a, a backup plan to make sure you're able to keep that three is very important. Can, can I ask one more question on this topic? Yeah, man, go ahead. <laughs> so, kind of like Hulk, um, anybody who's had any successful strategy with Hulk has probably realized you use him last in your activation chain. Where Where is Hela's place in that? Do you place her last, or...? Uh, if she is on her injured side, it is, she is either last... Or as soon as they uh, have worked to daze her. Gotcha. Or uh, to remove the soul tokens. Uh, because as soon as those are gone, you want her back up to activate. And unless you have like three different guys that are really low on health and you think Thor can get in there and uh, daze them all or finish them all off, uh, you want Hela activating when it's most convenient uh, for her to get the soul tokens back. And if she just ends up being your last activation, uh, she's able to put some work out with those soul tokens she's already got. Right on. <clears throat> oh, so that was me talking about the Asgardians for a good second. Uh, the the weak point already pointed out, and uh, as you mentioned, Todd, they are a little bit power hungry, especially Loki and especially Valkyrie, because they want power for so many different things. Hela, she really just wants the power for Claim Soul. Land of Hell's cool. Maybe the AoE is important. But more times than not, that soul token is going to be more important, uh, and the mystic part of it's really nice. Thor, I don't think it's really that power hungry. Sure, for Asgard costs three, but then you're getting a strike, which is probably going to get you some power back anyway. And, and a stagger. And a stagger, which is, <laughs> yes, absurd. Super, super worth it. Uh, and I find myself very seldom using hammer throw unless it's like a, hey, I've got this model holding an objective and I want to make sure that they keep holding that objective. Let me make you roll one less dice. God of Thunder is perfect in a very few situations. Uh, and if you get it off, that's great. But more times than not, uh, I'm using Thor strike anyway, so he's getting power back that way. Uh, but that is all I have on the Asgardians for kind of weak points and how they work. Uh, and as far as the crises, they really like, you, you want everybody clumped up. You want the gamma wave. You want the uh, the few uh, extraction objectives so nobody's running off. Uh, that kind of play style for me. Uh, Todd, tell us about the, the Wakandans and what little we know of the uh, Guardians. All right, so Wakandans. Wakandans is a lineup that... I've played a few times, and I generally take in my roster mainly to throw people off. Um, not that I actually want to play it on that many of my objectives, but more that the threat of it's there. Um, the Wakandan affiliation and the characters in that list are a very flexible lineup. You've got strong attackers. You've got good control. You have really good movement. And you have an amazing crisis card with Wakanda Forever. Um, for me personally, I kind of like this faction better as a splash. Two of the characters already work with other affiliations. Um, but as a unit on their own, uh, again, as talking with the Asgardians, for me personally, they feel very power hungry with the rerolls. Because um, you have to pay one for each reroll. And for me, one power equals one health. And one reroll equals half of a health because you got half of a hat. Pretty much, if you look at your die, they're almost split down the middle, right? A minus the uh, minus the misses, of course, unless you're Black Panther or or Kaplan is flip side. Your, your die are almost flipped, just split down the middle as far as to damage and, and defense. Um, yep. 
So, so for me, that one power with with the Wakandans in particular is worth about half a life or half a damage. Um, so it, that's why it's a hard affiliation for me to take a, as my base affiliation. I would rather have Cabal or Avengers um, personally. Uh, now, now, as far as weaknesses go, the way that I feel about these guys. They've got nothing with flying, and they've got nothing with wall crawlers. So anytime that you have terrain uh, in the way, they have to take the climb action. So they have movement issues when you look at the when you look in, into terrain. Um, there's also no characters in this list that can actually throw. Um, mm -hmm. And when you look into the flexibility of the list, the things that they can do well um, with their attack characters or with their ability to push a character off of an objective point with Shuri or the bodyguard ability with a Koye. There's only one character that can do any of those things in these lists. Um, so that become, that can be a detriment unless you take or splash characters that can supplement the other portion that you're looking to do well. Um, as far as crises go, uh, I, I think the herb crisis obviously is very well designed with them, especially with Black Panther in mind with his pounce ability to actually get around the restriction of moving once. Um, mm -hmm. I also think they play really well into the other extraction objectives. Anything where you have to pick up and hold and move and maneuver away, uh, these guys do have a strength there. Yep, sure he's good at keeping them away. Black Panther's good at getting away. Plays out nicely. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, and I think that actually does a, a pretty good job summarizing them. You you poked a couple of holes where uh, the, the mobility isn't great, the lack of uh, throwing around for damage is uh, non-existent. Uh, Justin, anything uh, you want to point out for him? Well, I mean, I agree with what he was saying. Their mobility, like, yeah, Black Panther is really fast, awesome, but none of them have wall crawler, none of them have fly, and... Those, especially Todd loves the drop-off play, <laughs> so not having that as even an option on the table is rough for him. <laughs> yeah, to... you're, you're giving away all my gameplay, Justin. Is that, is that your gameplay? I'm sorry. <laughs> well, you know, the, the lack of mobility for the, the unit is a little bit of a detriment, but I will say, though, the... For a guy who loves rerolls so much, I'm I'm a little weirded out to hear how down he is on the Wakandans. I thought he would be more into them, but no, no. Like I like the Wakandans. Like I like all of them individually. You were there when I did my my drunken tear episode. Like we we rated <laughs> all of these highly. Um, yeah. and and a, like every one of these characters is in my roster list, um, but not for the faction. Mainly as a splash character. That's fair. And like I said at the start when I gave my list, I really only use Wakandans in the 15 point mm -hmm. affiliation. Like, I don't, they are not the main faction in my 17, in my 18, in my 20. I don't, I don't, I would use Cabal every time. So yeah. I, I get what you're saying that they work better as a splash character. Like, you know, it's like, oh, I need some punch. We'll throw in Killmonger. Well, I need some control. Throw in Shuri. Yep. I need a tank. Throw in Black Panther. I need a bodyguard. Throw in Okoye. Like, yep. yeah, I mean, like, everything about them screams. Like, I, I, I almost wrote my article from the point of a Magic player, because I used to do that competitively, um, where mm -hmm. I was I was talking about the affiliations as colors. So like you, yeah. a lot of a lot of magic players have like a core color or a color that they like to lean towards, and then they splash another color. That's almost what Wakandans feel like to me. They're more of a splash where you're like, you know what? I need a little extra speed. Cool. I'm gonna take Black Panther, and he's durable. I need a little extra control. Cool. I'll take uh, Shuri, and she's got good power generation, and she can control a point. Like that's perfect. Or I need more damage. Cool. I'll take Killmonger. Not only that. You've got two characters in this list, in the Wakandan list, that are also splashable into other lists. So there's more flexibility in this list than any other list in the game. This is probably the most fluid affiliation they've put out so far. 
Yep, I, I agree with you guys completely. I've got three of the Wakandans in my ten as well, but I, I never plan on running the Wakandan affiliation. And I think one of the things that is... It's not really a detriment, but the only time I want to run Wakanda is if I have all four Wakandans on the table to make Wakanda forever the the most lethal card in the game. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but if you're only getting two attacks out of Wakanda forever, it's still really good, but it's not that it's not at that same tier where it's like, hey, here's four free attacks across the board exactly. that are gonna push things around that are gonna do pierce damage and it, there's a different feel for that for sure. Exactly. Um, are, are we good? Are we good on those guys? Or do we want to get into the next portion where we talk about characters we like to add to them? Uh, well, I, if you have any thoughts on uh, Guardians, I'd love to, uh, to hear you if want, you have oh. any. Uh... I have a lot of thoughts, thoughts on Guardians. <laughs> <laughs> How about like two minutes of thoughts on Guardians? <laughs> um, I absolutely love Guardians. Uh, they are actually, as soon as they come out, going to skyrocket to my number two affiliation. Um, I think they bring a totally different tactic to the game than what we've seen before. Um, if you look at the three characters that are coming out, that is three characters in an affiliation for eight points. That is amazing. Um, so what this does is open the game up to an entirely different style of play, um, which I haven't tried before. But I am excited to try with this, which would be a wide field of play where you're maximizing uh, character activations as opposed to going for higher punch value and priority control. Um, I've got an article coming out next week uh, that I'm doing with Turn Zero as far as theory crafting and roster building with these guys. Um, but you can get six to seven activations and a list with these guys with no problem. Um, the, the way that I'm looking at these guys is more of a, uh, what I'm calling a kill box team, uh, where you use the wider, uh, objectives. Um, again, Justin going against the grain, I am building from objective points. Um, <laughs> the, these guys have the ability to set up on exterior objective points and kind of create a kill box where as the characters enter, they can just gun them down. Um, and going back to a point that we made earlier about Ultron, I think Ultron is an amazing splash character with these guys because of the value you can get from Age of Ultron. Um, so for me, these guys are top tier. Um, I, I think these guys are going to be really good. And I can actually put together a 10 character list where I can run a highly aggressive 15 and a very efficient 17, 18, 19, and 20 point list. Yeah, because 19, uh, Star Lord's going to be coming with a 19 threat crisis that has some uh, interesting choice points in it, which uh, will also look, uh, will, will very likely change uh, how some people build lists for the, the higher threat tiers and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, uh, I will add, like, uh, I, I didn't go over weaknesses. I've, I feel like their weaknesses. And, are that they are not an interior team. Now that that's with only seeing three out of the what six or seven on the on the roster, mm -hmm. um, but but with what we've seen uh, so far, these guys seem like an exterior team that likes to set up on points, uh, maneuver around your opponents, and and cause chaos on the outside, not the inside. Um, so if if you have the ability to get to the interior, uh, I, I think you can do damage to these guys. Um, but they do have extremely high health totals for what they are. Um, Star Lord starts with 12 health on his healthy and day side. Groot has 14, uh, and Rocket has six. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the dude's a raccoon. What did you expect? I get right? it. I get it. Size one raccoon. Yeah, he's not going to be the toughest. But it, it, no, but if it, if, it, you, nor should he be. if you compare if you compare the uh, Rocket and Groot to other five point characters, say. Thor or Modok, right? Those are our other two. Both of them at five points have 14 health. These two together at five points have 20 health and two activations. So so that's that's a really, really high curve if you compare five points to five points. 
Yeah, that's a that's a really cool way of looking at it. Uh, I will point out real quick, Star-Lord does uh, drop a point of stamina on his entrance side, so he is only 11 uh, stamina. Not a not a, that that makes a huge difference, but worth pointing out. Yeah. Uh, My bad. Uh, <laughs> you're fine. He's, he's not even out yet. Like you, It's not like you have the card in front of you or anything. <coughs> Uh, I, I, I had I, his. I had his regular side. Yeah, uh, but I, I completely agree. I think they are going to be a, an affiliation that is extremely distinct because you can very easily uh, get four characters that have the Guardians affiliation at probably around eleven points, and then play with uh, what other utility toolbox characters. Uh, and go ahead and get into the next question a little bit. My third question was, who are three characters that aren't part of that affiliation that still do really well in that group? Uh, if you want to go ahead and uh, finish off, you mentioned Ultron. Do you have any other uh, All-Stars that you think are going to pop out well in the Guardians? So, I actually think that Guardians works phenomenally well, in theory. <laughs> <laughs> I threw the phenomenal in there for Mike. Uh -huh. um, so I, I think they work really well with Cabal. Um, if you look at the Guardians, um, very few superpowers that you need to worry about power interaction with. Um, Star-Lord has all free powers. Um, Rocket has the, the one, the booby trap ability that costs three, but I feel like that's one of those abilities that you're not going to use that often. And uh, Groot's abilities cost two, and if you're using them, he's probably taking damage already, which means he's making power. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so you can actually use the power gain for actual larger attacks, the Hydron attack or Star-Lord's secondary attack, which will just pile on status effects. Um, so I think they worked really well with Cabal. Um, so for me, Ultron is a front runner. Uh, Winter Soldier also is amazing in this lineup because he gives you that fourth character that you can give the Guardian affiliation so you can expand your list out even more. Because as you were saying already, with Winter Soldier, you're only at 11 points. And that's four characters. Um, so at 17, that gives you the option to bring in two more. Um, so that that's a really wide list with a lot of aggression. And then you also have the benefit of bringing, as we were talking about earlier with Ultron again, um, Age of Ultron. That That's a card that makes you not want to target Ultron, but now you have a secondary use for. Um, Killmonger is another character that fits really well in that list. He gives you a central threat that you can actually operate in the kill box. Um, Cause you want to put something out there that's going to be a target and a threat for them to have to deal with, right? Uh, Killmonger is a very good character to use for that because of how aggressive he is. He can build rerolls if they leave him alone. Uh, he, he's just aggressive. Um, and also Zemo. Zemo's fast. He grabs points. He moves them around. Um, if, if you don't deal with him, he's going to do some stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, being able to uh, kind of give him free Master Swordsman when he's uh, when you know he's going to be out there doing his drive-by, doing a charge into a sword rush or steel rush, uh, running around. That's going to be a, a very use, a good use of uh, the winging it uh, leadership ability. Exactly. Uh, Justin, do you have any other characters uh, that you would like to uh, throw out as uh, good uh, temporary membership for the Guardians? Well, I mean, Guardians are so cheap, really anyone works there. But just for flavor, I want to put Thor in there for Asgardians <laughs> of the Galaxy. <laughs> like, <laughs> but I mean, Thor, Thor is amazing by himself, no cards needed. He's just, his kit is awesome. So he works with any affiliation, anytime, anywhere. Doesn't matter who you bring in, Thor is good. So Thor is always going to be my answer for that. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, for me, the number one standout is actually Venom. Uh, Venom I really enjoy as a character. Uh, he's mostly tanky except for that two energy defense. But I think you can have a really great turn with winging it on him. 
because you have if you have the lethal protector card, you can pretty much guarantee that he's going to get attacked. You get rerolls on the defense for that attack, and then you're able to do the so many snacks into a we are venom that then has rerolls. And the only time that I have had my venom go down is when we are venom is not kicking off correctly. It's only like getting two hits on those seven dice, and it just feels bad. Getting those extra rerolls, I think, will make him a lot more consistent. Uh, Todd, do you want to go ahead and uh, talk about three characters who would be good in the Wakantan affiliation or appreciate being uh, a part of that group? Let's see here. So for Wakanda, the the guys that I wanted to add to that list, obviously Winter Soldier, if you're looking for anybody you want to close out a faction with, just seems to be the go-to guy. Um, because he can just replace any one character, give you out-of-turn damage, and the ability to just do some gross stuff and keep your affiliation bonus. Um on top of him, the other ones that I like are Hella uh, and Vision. Those are the two big ones for me in the Wakanda roster. I, I, I like think, it. Uh, yeah, I think Hella Hella's got that cool ability to add some extra die um, with with the soul tokens, uh, and you know, obviously the Wakanda rerolls are a thing. She she's one of those characters that can actually add a couple extra die. And benefit the most because she has the highest probability of doing damage. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And then Vision also gets you a pretty cheap throw in there for size three things. And the and beam attack, uh, right? So, like, you're, you're yeah. looking for for the the ability to build a high amount of energy um, and use it more effectively with the rerolls and the stuff that comes with Wakanda. Yeah, and the other uh, really disgusting thing that you can do between Shuri and Vision is you have two characters that are excellent for banking power, which lets you bring in some of those more expensive tactic cards like Advanced R&D, right. Follow Me, on that kind of stuff, yeah. I, I will add that Advanced R&D that came out of the Shuri pack is probably one of my favorite cards. Ooh. I like that idea. I, I, it's not one I've got to play with much, but uh, I, I'm looking forward to uh, getting a little bit more hands-on time with it. Justin, anybody you want to uh, throw into the Wakandans that's not Thor? Well, I mean, like, <laughs> I, like we kind of talked about earlier, there's such a good splash affiliation, and who doesn't love re-rolls? Like, it's hard to find someone who doesn't work well with them. Yeah. That's fair. That's fair. Uh... Well, going into uh, the Asgardians, the three that I'd like to be able to add into them, uh, the Vision or Captain Marvel kind of character, just a solid four threat that's going to really enjoy being able to shake the stun condition or really enjoy being able to sh shake Stagger. Uh, I don't think you want to try to flood the Asgardian affiliation with Black Widow and Okoye kind of characters because to take full advantage of the Prince of Asgard ability, you kind of want to have just more of an elite squad going in. Uh, with that being said, also Hulk and MODOK are great candidates. Uh, not that MODOK's able to take too many of the status conditions out there on his healthy side, uh, but for Thor, being able to shake a stagger is, uh, I dare say, phenomenal. <laughs> oh, man. Mike's going to love this episode. Uh then for the uh, Avengers, I have a pretty basic lineup. Uh, I think that anybody who's going to get the power cost of their abilities down to one consistently or have a lot of reactive abilities are going to love them. So Venom, Baron Zemo, and Loki are the three that I picked for that. Uh, Venom being able to start having his throws a little bit cheaper, the web snare cheaper, and being able to so many snack for one every single turn is very great because there are definitely points where you, d you want to be able to so many snack into a we are venom but you're just going to be short on power for it loki being able to i am god for or i am a god for one is a huge and trickster is definitely the most finesse superpower in the game right now i will have no disagreements about that but i think it's a uh, one to definitely keep an eye on 
And then Baron Zemo, he enjoys being close to other characters anyway, so having him buddy-buddy with Captain America within range two of each other gives him a little bit more durability while giving Captain America rerolls uh, for those defense on his entrance side is just uh, kind of stupid good stuff. Uh, Justin, anybody that you'd want to throw into uh, either of those affiliations? Well, as Guardians, I love the idea of a 15-point roster. We've got Thor, Hela, Loki. We have two points left over. I'm taking Rocket. Because either A, your opponent goes, hey, a three-health character sitting there, so easy to take him out, let's take him on. Hela's like, bring it on. Knock him out. I want that soul. You're not targeting me. You're not targeting Thor. You're not targeting Loki. We are going to destroy you next round. Or they ignore him, and he's five away on the back point, just blowing people away with his energy attacks. He's uh, like the best range damage you can give for two. I think he's great in that, that lineup. I 100% agree. I look forward to him coming out because I think Rocket is going to be a very easy two-point character to add to uh, any affiliation that just needs uh, some good damage output because he is every little bit of a glass cannon that a glass cannon can be. Yeah, but I, I want him to be a glass cannon in that list. Like, it's like, go ahead, target him. Please, go ahead, do it. That That's yep. exactly where I am with this guy. Like, I've been having this conversation with uh, the guys from Turn Zero, and I'm like, you know what? Rocket's going solo. He don't need no group. I, I, I think that guy has so much play that people are missing that if you think he only plays with Groot, um, you're going to be surprised. Yeah. All right, uh, Justin, round us out on this question. Who was, uh, who was uh, three characters you'd like to see uh, play well with the uh, Cabal? Well, I take anyone that can get multiple attacks in and around. I like Winter Soldier. I like Vision. I like Venom. Like, being able to, like, counterattack someone with a range 3 attack with Venom, getting extra power when you hit, and then whatever damage you deal, you get extra power. Like, that's, there's a, a, a kind of a stacking appeal. Vision with his beam attack, it's base, zero energy. You get to target three people, get three extra energy on top of whatever damage. You know, you can really build up big power to play cards like Dark Rain, or um, fund like a patch up or whatever whatever cards you brought to the table um, can be really uh, taken advantage of with those uh, uh, with the cabal ability. And I like all three of those characters. In fact, it's funny because at the, the list, they're all three at the bottom of the list: Venom, Vision, Winter Soldier. Like the last three alphabetically, but uh, <laughs> I like all three. Uh, all three of them in the uh, cabal. I like it. Uh, Todd, anybody you would want to uh, throw into the cabal? I, I agree with I agree with Justin on this. Like anybody that can take advantage of multiple attacks is probably your best target for Cabal, because um, they get the highest benefit from Red Skull's ability. I uh, completely agree, and for that reason, I think that the number one character that I would love. I wish he had the Cabal affiliation. It would make zero sense for him to. But I think Hulk benefits the most from it. Because <laughs> none of his attacks have the ability to generate power on their own. And so in none of the other affiliations, uh, your opponents kind of have this opportunity to just ignore this sixth threat character. And it limits his capabilities by a lot. Whereas as soon as Hulk gets in there and lays down a successful thunderclap on three characters, he gets that three power right back, uh, which is great. And then being able to Cosmic Invigoration on Hulk is... Uh, it, cosmic Invigoration... Like, Hulk gets two activations in a turn. It, he destroys things, whether he's damaged or not at that point. I, I, now you got me wanting to do a 15-point Red Skull, MODOK, Hulk list. Whatever, man. Bring that. <laughs> Bring, I was about to bring say, that I'm over here, that, man. Uh, Justin, I don't know if you were there for it, but I uh, I got to uh, at the first event that we did up at uh, Comic City. I took that and uh, won a game with it. That and I beat uh, awesome. I beat James with that list at one point too. <laughs> uh, that's good. I like it. it. It punches hard. It doesn't do much else, 
but it punches hard. I'm going to launch a Thor into your MODOK. That's what I'm going to do. Hey, uh, and sure you know what? That's going to be really bad for MODOK. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to go ahead and send us to the fourth question. And because we have gone far over what uh, these typically are supposed to, I just want uh, one word answers. Uh, the, fourth, the fourth question I have is how many affiliations can you comfortably fit into your roster of 10 with the releases we currently have now that we have access to the rogue agent innate ability? Justin? Two. Any more than Two. that, I don't have enough cards. The, the cards are what hold me back. I could f- comfortably fit three or four. It was just characters. But cards hold me back. I need two affiliations. That's it. That's my limit. Two. That wasn't Todd, that wasn't a one word answer, by the way. It was it, one word it, enough. It was a one paragraph answer. I'll take it at this point. All right, cool. <laughs> then I, I'm going to go here for a second. Um, three comfortably, with one being a bluff. Mm-hmm. That's 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 my answer. That's what I'm going with. Yeah. Uh, my, I also think three. I think the card point is the most valid point about why you really should probably keep it to two. But I'm not even running Winter Soldier in my list, and I can easily run any three of these affiliations. Uh, and the main reason I'm not running, planning on running those, is because I don't have uh, as many tactic card slots. So I think that's uh, two, two is probably where you should keep it but you can easily bluff a third and if you want to go crazy maybe you know a fourth after the guardians come out who knows uh but thank you guys so much for uh, joining me for this it's uh, really fun to always get uh, different people's perspectives on different parts of the game uh, especially when it's uh, from different metas and all that uh with all that being said i know justin doesn't have uh, too much to, to plug but todd uh, tell us where we can uh, find more about this podcast uh on facebook the end no no <laughs> yeah no uh on facebook uh turn zero gaming uh zero is spelled with a zero not an o um, yeah, it's z e numeral zero yeah so yeah you can find us there uh, we post articles and podcasts weekly um Justin also is part of that team. Like whether whether he's a full time member or not, whatever, he's part of my team. Um, it gets crowded on those podcasts when there's like five people. So yeah, but it's so I, much I'm, fun. I'm the spot fill. I'm the spot fill. Whatever, man. It's so much fun though. Like we love having <laughs> you. So, but yeah, like you can find us there. Um, just check us out on Facebook. Uh, we've got a Discord channel as well. Um, we're, we're starting to get more active in that venue. Uh, and yeah, just look us up, check us out. We're there. Awesome guys. Uh, well, everybody, uh, thanks for listening and keep on gaming.